Amen. We are thankful to our Father in heaven for every one of you who the Father has brought together. And here we are today. The ministry of the blood speaks for us. The authority of the name speaks for us. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. We run into it. We are safe. We are secure. And we thank him for the opportunity to learn from him concerning the kingdom. And the grace of the Lord is with us as we study. We study that we may understand what the Lord is saying. It is of his message that we are not consumed. The grace of our Father is with us in this series. And I want to ask every one of us, let's continue to learn. Please, whatever scripture is cited, it's your responsibility to cross-check it whether it is so. And so the Father wants to teach us about the kingdom, the one in the Bible, not the one manufactured out of fertile imaginations of humans, but the biblical kingdom of Elohim, which is the same as the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord wants us to see the how and the why, and that's just what he's been doing for some time. Today, we come to Course 111, the kingdom, lesson 16. The Alpha Church and the Kingdom. The last three lessons, we look at the scriptural survey of the kingdom, what Yeshua said, and the context in which the Gospels presented. Matthew presented it as kingdom of heaven because of his sensitivity to the Jews who don't like constant calling upon the name of Yahweh. They say don't call his name in vain. So they are very sensitive to the name God, Yahweh, Elohim. And so Matthew wrote a gospel in which he presented the kingdom, he called it the kingdom of heaven. Then Luke, um, and who wrote for the Gentile audience, and Mark, whose gospel was more universal, they called the same things the kingdom of God, because they wrote, and Luke wrote so that the Gentiles would know. That's why he traced the genealogy of Yeshua all the way to Adam, the father of the human race, whereas Matthew traced Yeshua's lineage up to David and Abraham, the two people that got the promise of the Messiah. John also spoke about the kingdom of God in his Gospels and, I mean, also in his epistles, especially the book of Revelation. And so, brothers and sisters, having done all those survey, it is important now that we come to examine the Alpha Church or the first century church that Yeshua gave the mandate, they saw him, they were with him, and they were the people who carried on the assignment. What then was his assignment? What did he tell them that they stuck to? In Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Yeshua gave them a very simple mandates. The gospel I'm giving to you is the gospel of the kingdom. Go and preach it in all the world, unto all nations, then the end shall come. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us to understand the same thing the Alpha Church understood and held on to, for which they were successful. Release your grace that will be able to finish what you use them to start by your grace. Let this word be very useful. Let it be impactful. Holy Spirit, we surrender to you to present Yeshua in the world to everyone using this vessel. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So the gospel of the kingdom that Yeshua asked them to go and proclaim had two critical dimensions. Number one was the rulership of Yeshua as king in the hearts of humans. And this happens when they first repent of their sins embrace his saving grace, abandon their own self-centered life, self-rule, and submit to his sovereign rule. But for this to happen, those who receive his saving grace, they need to be transformed in their hearts and in their minds. They need to be renewed by the systematic presentation of the word until it is made flesh. In other words, even though somebody is saved, believe in the heart, confess with the tongue, and save. If you stop there, and that is actually the basic failing of Christian religion, even the evangelical type, is that they can lead people to salvation by grace. But growth is no longer into kingdom truth. Growth becomes into the denominational issues, dogma, into the church, attendance, building, cash, 
But the Alpha Church understood a principle that people don't just believe in the heart and confess with the tongue. Yeshua told them that their work needs to be done. That's what he meant in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Look at the word he used. He didn't say preach. Teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Ghost. That's another important factor. Some people think baptism is an add-on. Well, you like, you do, you don't. The king put it as part of the Great Commission. That when somebody truly surrenders to him, the, one of the things the person can do outwardly to show what is inward is you call your friends and family and you take a baptism in a public place, a river, a stream, you know, a water side. And the whole idea is to say, you know what? Look at me. Just as I'm now being dipped in the water, I am identified with the death of Yeshua. And as I'm coming out of the water, I'm identified with his resurrection. I'm a new person. I've left the old. It's now by the side. I embrace the lordship of Yeshua. That's what baptism ought to do. Let me ask you, since you will believe, have you been baptized in water? Are you still going with the old baptism you had when you were, you know, when you were in the Orthodox world, you were in that church that was part of Orthodoxy? Baptism is not an add-on. It's not a suggestion. It's not a good idea. It is part of the Great Commission. The Lord said, do that. And even if it's just to fulfill all righteousness, you shouldn't keep it aside. And so it's so important. You say, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, you know, to identify with divinity. Then he said in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Teaching them. So the kingdom is formed in the hearts of people. The more we systematically teach them the word, they give way. Their old mindset, their old ideas, their old ideologies, their old attitudes give way to the authority of the word. And as the word is formed in them, Yeshua is dwelling in them by faith. And they come to a place where they are built up in him. They are rooted in him. And when it is so, they no longer struggle with kingdom culture. They no longer struggle with the reality that he reigns in their heart. And that is how, brothers and sisters, from one person to family, the person affects the family. Remember, the kingdom is like a leaven. A woman took a heed in measures of flour until all was living. So when you do this to one person, that person will now be transformed life and renewed mind will bring about a change of life that will be so evident that that person will literally begin to touch the people that the person is in touch with. First at the family, then the local assembly, I mean, then the uh, neighborhood, then the community. And that is the way it works. So that in this way, kingdom culture replaces worldly culture. The kingdom world doing things. The old selfish one, gone. The selfless one emerges. They used to do things to be known by men, to be hailed by men. You come to the place where you are no longer doing things to be known by any man or hailed by any man. Whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord. In thought, in word, and deed, you are conscious of the king within you. Men and brethren, it is this consistent uh, teaching of the word that also helps the people to see themselves not growing into an organization of men, not growing into a religious system of men, but to see yourself growing to the point where you embrace yourself, your identity as a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is what Yeshua came to establish. You see, the king of the kingdom established a priesthood paradigm. That priesthood paradigm is called the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. He is the high priest. He is seated in the heavens and he is our chief priest and high priest right there. And that priesthood order is a simple, uncomplicated priesthood. It's one that doesn't mind where you are coming from, whether you are male or female, young or old, rich or poor, whether you are African or Asian, whether you are Russian, whether you are Chinese, whether you are American, whether you are Pacific Islander, whether you are European, Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, 
and you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness, darkness of Satan ruled world, darkness of selfish, self centered world, darkness of self rule, and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of Elohim which had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. And then he said, we are strangers and pilgrims. The world is on the broad way. We are on the narrow way. It's a different lifestyle. It's a different culture. It's a different world, different kingdom, two kingdoms in the same earth. Brothers and sisters, these are the things the Lord wants us to know. And in order to execute this awesome assignment of turning individual sinners to become people who have embraced Yeshua, in order to make them that when you embrace him as Savior, it's not enough. You need to press in to have him enthroned as king. To preach this, he gave them his Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit he functioned with, the same Spirit of the Father, the same Spirit of Yeshua. He said in Acts chapter 1 from verse 6, I know you're excited, you want to go for me, but please don't go. He said in verse 8, but you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Brothers and sisters, all the 120 disciples who received Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, they were persuaded in one thing, that Yeshua is King, who reigns supreme in their hearts. And they were all part of one invisible kingdom nation with a mandate to bring in those who are outside, but appointed thereunto into the kingdom. And men and brethren, they thought that any one of them could go and build his own church the way he wants, and teach whatever he wants, preach whatever he wants, just couldn't settle in them. No, they knew. So even Paul the apostle, the Lord used mightily to extend the kingdom into the nations of the earth. It was appointed. He would do all that, and he would go report back to the Jerusalem council because he knew they were doing one work. So whether Peter was doing it or Paul or Thomas or anyone, they knew they were all doing the same work of the same king in the nations of the earth. This is part of the things the Lord wants us to recover today. There's so much emphasis on church name, church label, that to the degree that the average person that goes on evangelism in most of the Orthodox churches and even the Pentecostal and uh, evangelical churches that have gone Orthodox now, is they go essentially to go and increase membership of the church. It's not the same as the kingdom. When you are preaching the gospel of the kingdom, you want to introduce sinners to the king, to submit to him, and to trust Holy Spirit that he knows who the Father has appointed to be the shepherd of the people, to give them the nurture they need. And if you can't do this, then you are struggling with the gospel of the kingdom. If you must go to talk about your pastor, your overseer, you must go to talk about that great man of God you are affiliated with, then you are not talking about the gospel of the kingdom. If you must go to preach the name of your church and religious organization or network, then you are not talking about the kingdom. It's about everybody presenting the king and presenting the kingdom and this thing the moment we recapture it, you are going to see an explosion in revival. That is to say, we must repent of these narrow ways we have divided the body and stay in it, unable to budge. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 1. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit and one Lord, and one spirit, sorry, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Awesome. So it doesn't matter where you are, we are preaching the same king. We are preaching the same kingdom. No confusion. So it doesn't matter whether somebody met him in a train, they met Yeshua HaMashiach as the king of the kingdom. Whether they met him in an aircraft, they met Yeshua HaMashiach, the king of the kingdom. Whether anybody met him anywhere in a desert place, on a farmland, anywhere in the city, in a mall, they are meeting the same king, the same kingdom, and they realize we are all one in the Lord. 
brothers and sisters, this is awesome. And that's why let's look at the way the book of Acts opened. The book of Acts opens with the reality that Yeshua in his glorified state, wearing the body suit that was given to him at the resurrection morning, he found it necessary to spend 40 days after his resurrection to give them deeper insight into the kingdom. Acts 1.3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of Elohim. And having waited for three and a half years, seeing that Yeshua being raised from the dead and being resurrected, the disciples concluded, wow, the kingdom that we know of as Jews, the kingdom we have waited for in following this Messiah is just about to be inaugurated. Remember, that's one of the reasons why the mother of James and John came to lobby him because they were looking at the kingdom as something that would immediately appear. So there too, if you look at Acts again, we're told that from verse 6, when therefore they will come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. It's not for you to know. There's work to be done. Go and do the work. When you receive power of Holy Spirit, go and represent me unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And the Lord alone knows. Only divinity knows the day the last person, citizen of the kingdom, will come through. Whether they're going to come through, the brethren in the USA, the brethren in Asia, in Africa, whatever, the Lord being omniscient and omnipresent, he knows. We don't know. None of us knows. That's why I say just go and preach. And men and brethren, that's what they went about doing. And I want to say this to you. One of the things the gospel of the kingdom should do to every one of us is to give us a sense that, look, one, a default setting in our mind that the king is coming. He may come any now. So there's no time I have to kind of put off the kingdom and go to wear something different. There's no time I take a little bit off him. No, he's everywhere. And because of that, they lay their hand on the plow and they labored to make sure. Why? The Alpha Church was persuaded in the divine nature of Yeshua as the king of the kingdom. For them, his person represented by his name and his power, which was manifested by his kingdom authority, were the two most priceless assets they had. If they didn't have anything, they knew one thing, that the king was in their hearts. And they knew that the authority of the kingdom was for them to alter as circumstances would shift. And they were willing, therefore, to stake everything, if you go to Acts 4 and Acts 5, when they try to shut down the gospel, they say, Why, what name are you preaching? They told them. They were willing to die for the faith. The same Peter, who was so fearful that he couldn't stand in maid after Pentecost. Peter could stand and, and talk to the Sanhedrin of Israel, rebuke them. You killed the righteous one. And brothers and sisters, what of Philip? Philip was a deacon in the top heavy Jerusalem church. Top heavy with apostles. <laughs> Can you imagine 12 apostles? A deacon. He's just to serve tables. When he ran for his life to Samaria, after the persecution of Saul in Acts 8, he ran for his life. And what happened? In Samaria, he preached. And you know what did he preach? Verse 12 tells us that when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of Elohim and the name of Yeshua, they were baptized both men and women. So that's what he preached in Samaria, and the whole city was turned upside down. Then he sent for Peter and John. He sent for the apostles in Jerusalem. They sent Peter and John to come and confirm the saints across Asia Minor. Paul and Barnabas preached the kingdom also in Acts 14.22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of Elohim. I don't know what you are going through in your workplace. I don't know what you're going through 
in your neighborhood. I don't know what you're going through. People misunderstand you. You do good to people. They pay you with evil. Paul said it almost 2,000 years ago that we must with much tribulation enter into the kingdom. Can you be encouraged by that? That what you are going through now is known by the Lord and is appointed that that thing will not destroy you. Those things will not destroy you. They will actually give you the grace to be able to press into the fullness of the kingdom. Men and brethren, and Paul the apostle, when he spoke with the people, look at what happened again in Acts 19 verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of Elohim. Look at that. That's what he did. That was the core of his message. He's speaking to elders of the church at Ephesus. Paul made it clear that his ministry was about the kingdom in Acts 20, 25. And now behold, I go Sorry, and now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. That's what he preached to them. Men and brethren, even till the end of his ministry to Jews in Rome, and that was the closure of Acts of the Apostles, two things were written towards the end of the Acts of Apostles, verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came to him unto his lodgings, that is the Jews in Rome, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of Elohim, persuading them concerning Yeshua, both of the, out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And brothers and sisters, the chronicle of the church, the Alpha Church in Acts of the Apostle, it ended on this note, verse 30, 31 of Acts 28. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him, that one, preaching the kingdom of Elohim and teaching those things which concern the Lord Yeshua with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And that was the end of Acts of the Apostle. So you see that the Alpha Church concentrated on the presentation of the kingdom. That was the mantra. And you know what we told you before? Don't forget this, that from later in that first century, all the way to the fourth century, the gospel was dived into something else called Christian religion. Brothers and sisters, let's look at the epistles and see how the epistles was also about the kingdom in Romans 14, 7. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, the properties of the kingdom, that when the king is dwelling in you, you have the righteousness of the Father. You're not going to go about with sin consciousness, but you'll be conscious of what he purchased for you at the cross because He we exchange our sins for the righteousness of the Father in him, according to 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And so the kingdom, therefore, is about the righteousness of the Father in him, shalom or peace that we enjoy because we no longer have a controversy with the Father. We have made peace with Him. His peace dwells in us and we are able to be peacemakers wherever we find ourselves. We are people the Lord uses to make peace. And then there's this joy of the Lord, the joy of knowing that if today is the end of our pilgrimage, we will meet Him in glory. The joy that, you know what? He's with us in all situations. He gives us a hidden joy the world cannot touch. And therefore, in writing to the church at Corinth, Paul also said something about the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 4.20 For the kingdom of Elohim is not in word, but in power. Starting with the power of the transformed life and the power of the life the Lord can use to do exploits, bringing the kingdom, bringing the heavenly realm into the earth realm when you cancel the laws of nature. Because that's what the kingdom does. The laws of nature are taken away. And then, also, Paul went on to tell the people, don't be presumptuous. Don't be presumptuous that you're part of the kingdom. He gave them what we call exclusion clauses, so that anybody will know. He told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 9 to 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous, somebody may be in church, was born again, but somehow little things have come in, and now the life is unrighteous. 
know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim? He says, not this. He says, if somebody lives in unrighteousness, the person can inherit the kingdom. Then he told them, he began to expand it. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Twice. He said, no. The unrighteous. Then he broke down ten things. He broke down here. What of in Galatians chapter 5, from verse 15 to 21, to tell them that, look, there's no joke about this. You are either in or out. If you are in, guard it with all diligence. He said in verse 21 of Galatians, uh, verse 15 of Galatians 5. But if you bite one and if you bite and devour one another, that is to say, no longer living in sin, but living in criticism and offenses against one another, he says, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And that's what happened in the body. People are being consumed with hatred, with animosity, with evil speaking, with biting one another. Then he said in verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. He began to enumerate again, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uncleanness. I mean, adultery, you know, immoral acts involving at least one person married, fornication, immoral acts involving single people or married people. Then uncleanness, things like pornography, uncleanness, things like all the people messing up themselves with themselves, uncleanness, things that are not clean in the sight of Elohim, lasciviousness, a life that just wants luxury and, and, and entertainment and lasciviousness works against spirituality. Then he, he says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and idolatry. Having anything in the heart that is so huge, so great, that it beclouds our seeing the Lord. Anything that takes his place, whether it is husband, whether it's wife, whether it's, you know, whatever it is that we are we esteem so highly that it pushes the word of the Lord, pushes the presence of the Lord aside. It talks about that. Idolatry. Then witchcraft. Whether the one involving magical acts to cast spell on people and, you know, suck blood and all that, or the one of controlling people to do one's bidding and subduing the will of people, then hatred, hating people for any reason under the sun, hating people. It doesn't matter what they did. Hatred, he varies. Somebody not being able to, be, you know, connect with others because you want to be alone. You want to do things the way you don't want to be under authority. You want to do whatever you want. Go out where you want, do whatever you want. Nobody will ask you, what are you doing? Various. Then emulations, the one which is the opposite of various, where anything somebody has, you want it. Somebody wore this shoe, you want it. Somebody wore that dress, you want it. Emulations, the rot, hot anger that cannot be controlled, like a volcano. Then strife, you know, striving for things. Then sedition, speaking evil against authorities, both spiritual authorities and even natural authorities, including those in government. Ah! The Bible says that when Michael the archangel went to take the body of Moses, when Moses died, Elohim sent Michael to go and fetch the body from Mount Pisgah where he died. You know what? He got there. Here was Satan coming to take the body. Satan thought he had tricked uh, Moses. He had seduced Moses and that he, Moses was now his property. The Bible says that Michael did not bring a raiding accusation against Satan. He recognized that Satan was an authority. He used to be Lucifer. Right there, you know what he said? The Lord, the Lord who sent me rebuke you. He didn't go, you stupid man. Look, today you see people, anyhow, you abuse your president, you abuse your governor, you abuse your senator. 
No, that's sedition. You abuse your overseer. You abuse men and women of God who are doing the work of God because they are walking in the spirit and you are walking by the flesh. You get offended and you abuse them. That's sedition, brothers and sisters. And of course, anything you do that comes against the authority of Yeshua in you is sedition. Then heresies, all kinds of doctrines and dogma that are not true. Envies, murders, drunkenness, reveling, spartying, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, even though they are in church, he wrote to the Galatian Christians, just as he wrote to the Colossian, uh, Corinthian Christians, they shall not inherit the kingdom. These are serious. Can you go and ask yourself, Based on First Corinthians six, based on Galatians five, is there any of these things in me? Don't 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 give a quick answer. Go and ask Holy Spirit, search me, O Lord, and see if there be any of these things in me, so that I can repent of them. That is the way to live. That's the way to grow. Men and brethren, the saints who will inherit the manifest face of the kingdom will do so in glorified bodies. They will be received on the day of the first resurrection and the rapture. That's what we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 49. And as we are born the image of the earthly, earthy, so shall we be at the image of the heavenly. As we came into this world in the likeness of Adam, natural body, so he says we are going to be at the image of the heavenly Yeshua. Verse 50, 1 Corinthians 5, 15. Now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, neither the corruption inheriting corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Everyone will be changed. Those who died before Yeshua returns and those who are alive. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the dead, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise first, incorruptible. And we shall be changed. So there will be a day where the Lord will throw off the old garment, the old physical body, and give us a new body. But those who have moved on and finished their pilgrimage, they will rise first. And then those who are alive and remain. Men and brethren, one of the overlooked scripture is the one which gives clear light that the manifest kingdom itself is dated. That is to say, the manifest kingdom is not forever and ever. It is dated. And the Bible calls it a millennium, 1,000 years. And after 1,000 years, something interesting will happen. What is that? First Corinthians 15, 24. Then come at the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Elohim, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. In other words, when Yeshua who reign as king of the kingdom for a thousand years when he finishes his hand over to the Father. This is a part of the mystery. Why? Revelation 10, 7 tells us. You see, no matter what we think we know from scripture, we know better a little. Revelation 10, 7, And in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, the mystery of Elohim should be finished. As he had declared to his servants the prophets. What we know of the Father is not complete and conclusive. What we know is the much. The Bible says in, in the book of Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord. The things that are revealed belongs to us. There's enough in the Holy Scriptures for us to know. To live the kingdom life. And in future. When it, when it, it pleases the Lord. There will be total illumination of all things. So, in his epistle to the Ephesians, Paul made it clear that sin was a disqualifier from this glorious inheritance. Ephesians 5.5 5. And this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, had any inheritance in the kingdom of Yeshua and of Elohim. No one. Brothers and sisters, we need to take note. So that is why, beyond salvation of souls, the new birth experience also represents a shift in kingdoms. Remember, we are told in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So as far as Paul, the apostle, knew, he and his fellow 
workers were involved in one central project. What is it? Kingdom business. Colossians chapter 4 verse 11. And, Yesh, and Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers into the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. And brothers and sisters, in exhorting the Thessalonians, Paul also made it clear they were called into the kingdom. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12, that you walk worthy of, of Elohim who has called you into his kingdom and glory. And then in 2 Thessalonians 1 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of Elohim, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of Elohim for which also you suffer. And writing to Timothy's protege, Paul reminded him to always be aware of the kingdom to come. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before Elohim and the Lord Yeshua, who shall judge the quick and the dead at the appearing and his kingdom. You see, they were so wrapped up in the reality that if you enthrone him here in your heart right now and keep him there without, you know, allowing the nature of Satan to return to you and you grow in him, then the day is coming, you may part of the manifest kingdom. Men and brethren, Paul also said something to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse, 6, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. I will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that is why it's so important for us, brothers and sisters, that we too will be persuaded about these things. Talking about men of faith of old, Hebrews 11 verse 33, look at part of what was said of them, who through faith subdued kingdoms of the world, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of liars, the faith they had in the Lord, gave them the capacity to subdue every other kingdom because the superior kingdom was in their heart. And that's why Paul could write something about Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve Elohim acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The kingdom we have cannot be moved. And the Lord wants us to be people who cannot be moved by any noise. We cannot be moved by the voices of men, because the voice of the Lord, which tells us it is well, should be strong enough that we should be better than that woman who, when they ask her about the child, is it well with your child? She says it is well. Because she just wanted to meet Elisha, the prophet. Shall we stand upon it is well and know that truly it is well? Men and brethren, we have some other references, but our time is up. You can go to the teaching note today. If you are in the master class, it will be posted in the classroom. Otherwise, it will be posted in different groups on Facebook. Go and see that the Alpha Church was very much about the kingdom. You ask yourself, what happened? Between the Alpha Church and now, the church backslid. Other doctrines came. The church was bewitched. And today, the Lord wants to take away the bewitchment and to lead us back to the kingdom. By way of assignment, number one, please give a summary of this lesson, bringing forth five main things which minister to you from all that was said. Five things that minister to you. Number two, kindly cite the ten passages. That's scriptural references that we mention. Out of all, we mention any ten of them that ministered most to you. I want to ask you to reflect. Are you going to remain in Christian religion and churchianity? Are you going to remain in ABC churchianity, attendance building cash? Are you going to build your own empire, your own kingdom, and think the Lord will rubber stamp it for you? Or are you willing to lay all down and say, God, Elohim, deliver me while I'm still alive. Deliver me everything that is false from historical failures of churchianity that has crept into me. Lord, I dethrone self from myself, from my, the altar of my, of my being, my heart. And let Yeshua come and reign supreme. Give me the assurance and confidence to know that if I remain in you, 
till the day of the trumpet, I'll see you in glory and I'm going to be a co-ruler and co heir with you. I want to pray with you if that's your uh, decision. Say with me, Father in heaven, let the entrance of your word give light. Lord, I renounce self-rule in any shape or form. Father, today I declare that I will no longer be ruled by my belly, by my ambition, by my quest for money and material things. Lord, I ask you, Yeshua HaMashiach, I open the, my heart, even as I repent of self-rule, come into my heart, rule, reign, take over, guide me by your spirit into your will, and keep me until that day when I finish my pilgrimage or the rapture will come. If you pray that prayer sincerely in your heart, Father, I ask you to do what you do best. You know how many people who have had this word, who have responded, Lord, receive them. Let there be a translation into your kingdom. And let them abide therein. Let them not step out of it. Let them not learn the ways of Babylon. Let every leaven of Babylon be taken away from them. Thank you, Father, for answering this prayer. To you be all honor and glory. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen. And amen.